Well, today I get to preach on one of my favorite topics, me. <laughs> this great topic comes up because Friday was the 10th anniversary of my ordination as a minister into the United Church of Christ. And given my history, that is a really big deal. And even as a kid a little about it, I don't raise this as a matter of conceit. It's important that there be context to the stories I tell, the sermons I preach, and the theology that I teach. And I also want to celebrate the Holy Spirit's efforts to get me this far and here together in this awesome ministry in Mount Vernon, Ohio. So that's why we have the red pyramids that represent the Spirit. And who knows? If I'm lucky enough, I'll get to do this again in this sanctuary on the 20th anniversary in 2016. Hopefully, even then, I will still look like a young Tom Selleck. Uh. <laughs> to look at me today, you've actually probably noticed I look way older than 10 years in the vocation should have me looking. While being a minister can take its toll, it's not responsible for all this aged look. I am what they call a second career minister. Most of you know that I was a lawyer for 16 years before going to seminary. But before going to law school in my mid-twenties, I was a restaurant manager. And before that, I was, of course, the world's greatest undiscovered actor. <clears throat> and even now, I suspect that I am. <laughs> But if we go way, way back to the 1970s, back to my teens, I began attending a neighborhood church in fulfillment of a promise to God if alcohol abuse would stop on my family. And in that church, I first felt love and acceptance. Pretty powerful stuff for a troubled adolescence. I believe that finding love in that church saved my life, and it gave me an unshakable conviction that God is love, a touchstone of my personal theology ever since. And shortly after discovering the God of love, very early in my adolescence, I felt called to be a minister, and I became very involved in local and statewide youth leadership. But within a few years, my insistence that the God of love could not condemn anyone to hell caused a rift, and I left the church that saved me. And I wandered from church to church for quite a few years, trying to find the place where I encountered a theology centered on the God of love. And eventually, in my late teens, I gave up looking. And I gave up the idea of being a minister too, since it's really hard to be one if you don't have a religion. Shortly after my decision to leave church, I know it may sound odd, but I had a powerful powerful dream, so vivid a vision that it has never left my senses and continues to influence me to this day. It's impossible, impossible to adequately describe the vision in words, but the gist of it is that a friend's father was dying in a hospital. I didn't know that, but, my but he mystically appeared to me in a dream, and he was dying in the dream as I later learned at the exact same time that he was really Die. And the vision was the most dynamic moment I have ever experienced. The whole thing was bathed in a warm, golden glow, exuding a love, a joy, a peace that soaked everything. That amazing blessing of a dream confirmed and kept alive in my soul. I experienced that God is love, even after I stopped going to church for 20 years. I then became spiritual, but not religious, before it was popular to do so. And then 20 years later in Oregon, I was walking my dog on a sunny Sunday morning, when what to my wondering, I should appear through a UCC church window, but a friend singing with the rest of the congregation. I thought, I'll go check it out. And thankfully, I stumbled upon, or as I like to think now, God guided me to a group of Christians who practice and preach a Christianity of love and compassion where the God of love is followed with structure and community and long, long tradition. 
And I soon learned that this love-filled church was not an aberration, but one of many in a God of love-centered denomination called the United Church of Christ. And I was soon walking hand in hand with others down a progressive, compassionate Christian path to the sacred. A path that led me to new ways of seeing religion, sacred text, and sacred rituals, and especially new ways of experiencing Christianity and church. The Christianity I experienced in that UCC church was not blustery. It didn't require unquestioned belief and intolerance of other paths or the need for a God who sends folks to hell. But a Christianity of a Christ so loving, so peaceful, so inclusive, and so genuine, I happily embraced it. And I came to see it as the way of experiencing and serving the very God of the warm, golden glow and love and joy and peace I encountered in my dream. And the God of love that I first glommed onto as a young teen. And through that UCC church in Oregon, I finally found a window that I could daily look to and experience God. Not just in the remnants of a dream or memory or, or chance encounters, but through what theologian John Cobb calls a field of force. The very way Jesus created with his life and death and resurrection. The way that's been passed on from generation to generation by love-centered Christians. And once I embraced this love-centered Christianity in midlife, the old call to be a minister started to ring out loud again. And so I looked all over the country for a seminar, seminary, and the only one that appealed to me was Eden Theological Seminary in St. Louis. And I, I wasn't sure how we were going to pay to for it until I was offered a full scholarship. And Nancy said, we got to go. So we went. And so there was this... Grand conspiracy, decades in the making, to save me, get me to ordination. That's how I see it. At the end of seminary, I was in an airport on the way to my ordination exam in Oregon when by accident or design or as a part of the divine conspiracy, I ran into the dean of the seminary at the airport. She bought me a lot, chatted about our families, and then she offered this advice about the exam. It all comes down to being about relationship, relationship. She's right. Christianity and church is all about relationship, relationship with God and creation and others and our self. And I rocked the ordination exam, if I must say so myself, and the ecclesiastic council ended with a very cheerful standing ovation that I will never forget. The day of my ordination was even more memorable. My family was flown in, my beloved in-laws and sister were there, friends from law school and lawyering came, even a very dear friend from my teen years who lives in Alaska was by happenstance or conspiracy nearby in Oregon camping. And she came too with her mom and husband. That church was packed with many other friends and church brothers and sisters and beloved pastor peers. The ceremony was filled with so much love and the very, very palpable presence of God. And at one point, everyone in the church stood and gathered around and they laid hands on me, a traditional part of ordination. The picture of it is in the back of the bulletin. And I was on my knees and the weight of all those hands upon hands upon hands was almost overwhelming as I bent to the power of God in the hands of all those gathered. And in that bending, I was up lifted in another indescribable moment of conspiracy by God to send me on this remarkable 10-year journey as a clergy person. The moment of my ordination was one of love, drenching the moment, that place and me. It was remarkable. Best midlife crisis ever. <laughs> and the conspiracy has not ended because my first call was supposed to be as an assistant pastor to develop a youth theater ministry and other family related ministries in sunny Florida near the ocean. That led to a series of events that pretty quickly morphed my call into being the lead pastor there where I learned on the fly in a time of great crisis to lead a church about the size of this one. And in two and a half years, somehow God conspired to bring me here to Ohio with you, this wonderful church in this really great town full of a bunch of good people. 
And you may have heard me say this before during the search that brought me here. I had the chance to consider calls in a lot of other places, including Florida, Hawaii, and Southern California. And I say that not to uplift me, but this church. I've never been to Ohio before, but I did know its winter weather is quite different than Orlando, Honolulu, and L.A. <laughs> and I've since learned it's not so near the ocean. <laughs> and I chose to accept the call because God resonated in virtually everything connected to this church during the search. What first drew my attention, though, was when Nancy read the church profile, church resume, she got so excited. The church profile was the only paperwork in the entire process of the call that we went through that she literally hugged. And when I saw that profile, I wanted to hug it too. I read about a church that dovetailed with my own written profile. Both of us even quoted the Micah text on the wall behind me. And both clearly showed we shared an interest in actually actively seeking justice and loving kindness and walking humbly with our God, which inspired the lyrics at two in the morning a few months ago that my friends set the music and Mike and Chris and Aaron just led us in. It's so nice to hear that. But it's also inspired, along with God and Jesus, the difficult work we have done in our doing together on justice issues regarding the poor, women, LGBTQ, and people of color. We are holding a conversation at noon about what we can do to end racism, to promote racial justice. We planned this meeting months ago. There's no more pertinent issue this week than that. And Wednesday, we're holding a peace vigil out there on the topic of hate shootings and, and peace. Racism and hate shootings of anyone must end. And this little community, so with God, can do God's work to help, to help in that, to bring about peace. And as Nancy and I were considering this church for this call, the conversations with the pastoral search committee and later the congregation, you all convinced me that we didn't just have nicely matching profiles, but we're both really, truly, very much in expressing God is love in worship and in mission and ministries in the church all week long. We're trying, we're trying to live that out. And it seems counterintuitive, but I learned way back in my teens, living into the belief that God is love and our words and deeds is not Every church community's expression in worship and in missions and ministries all week long. And so I was very careful to look for a church whose cup of tea was this God of love thing, this seek justice and love kindness thing, this humbly walking with God thing. And it doesn't always go over well. It sounds all nice and warm and fuzzy, and it very often is, but even though it is very biblical, when we play it out in our lives, it can sometimes almost overwhelm us as we get bent by negative responses. One of the most difficult things about love is that when we offer it unconditionally, and especially include people placed on the margins, it can stir things up. Love spread beyond acceptable boundaries disturbs. Love put into action brings about discomfort. That's certainly a lesson I've learned again and again and again. Helping to put love into action may be my sense of call, it may be all of our sense of call, but at times that action does not bring a sense of comfort or even agreement on how to go about it. The members of this church are, are serious about justice issues, and by and large we hang in through the discomfort and disagreements. That's how loving Christians live in covenant. It's not just on Justice issues. Like Jesus, we invite into the community all manner of people. Many of us are broken, and sometimes we are in the presence of those who make us uncomfortable. They don't like us, or we don't like them. They or we act out in ways that create uncomfortable moments. We want church to be comfortable. But like life, it's not always so. Some leave. But it's family, so most of us try and stay and keep the loving part in front of us. Despite the loss 
anger or even insults, gossip and dislike that sometimes generate in church, it's best to try to work things out respectfully, lovingly. And that's true even if we don't always like what's happening or, for that matter, one another. And so the hardest thing I've learned over the years is that it's not easy to be a progressive Christian promoting love. People get upset about love and disagree about how to best do it or when to best do it or even if we should do it at all in a given circumstance. Before I went to seminary, a seasoned pastor in another denomination in another state took me to lunch and he cautioned me that a double digit percentage of the congregation at any given moment will not like the pastor. That's the hardest thing I've learned is that my pastor friend is right. And I regret that. I really, really regret that. It can be hard, hard reality to accept. But I believe that regardless, we're all here to seek and pursue and try and be loved. And you know what? All that loving, all that seeking by those who are here and of course by God makes this church an overwhelming, positive experience. And now the greatest lesson I've learned, the good and positive news I've learned, includes the same one I first learned. The church can lead us to the God who is love. But added to that is that we must love, love, and be loved. At the end of the day, I am in a vocation, a vocation that lets me talk about love and research love and try to bring love into worship and into the church community and out into the world and even into people's homes. Part of that is I have a great, great privilege of being with folks at the most vulnerable and precious times, from baptisms to births to weddings and praying to times of death to celebrating lives to illnesses to heavy concern to, to moments like this in worship where we intentionally come to be breathed on by the breath of God, one of my favorite hymns. And in all those moments, I especially sense God's presence and aim to help others to do so too. And here on Sundays, it tends to be extremely positive and filled with those moments. We set aside our differences. We gather and turn to the holy for an hour, maybe more, if we hang around and have fellowship. Go to class. We sense more of God here on Sundays. The God we live and move and have our being in. The God who is love. The God who is with us from our morning cry to our last breath. Another of my favorite hymns. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of that. A very important part of that on Sundays and throughout the week. As we struggle to do God's difficult work in the world. To love, love, and to be love. I decided I, here at the end I'm going to abruptly switch gears and tell you what I recall maybe the funniest thing I've done as a pastor so far. <clears throat> it's not this sermon. It's much more humbling. In Florida, I got up in the pulpit one Sunday. They introduced a sermon on the parable of the worthless servant. Instead, I introduced it is about being about the parable of the worthless sermon. <laughs> and a good friend of mine, sitting about right there, yelled out, Freudian slip! <laughs> May I never be God's worthless servant or preach a worthless sermon and should either occur. Forgive and know that despite any failures, I love you and God loves you and you matter.